trade with their liberty, uh, with their uh, country, with their lives even, uh, for this prophetic witness that is so much a part of Christian vision. I'm glad that your vision statement actually sets out quite clearly uh, what practical action you are expected um, to um, be familiar with as you study here and as you leave to go out into the wider world. And this has always been part of Christian mission. In the earliest days, we are told by people who study the sociology of the early church, yes, I'm not joking, this is a discipline, um, what the early Christians did, they were found these Christian women were found in the most disreputable parties and giving them a decent bed. They were rescuing infants who had been left out to die by their parents. You know, uh, I was in Baghdad, as I was saying, uh, about a year ago, and uh, it's very depressing, to be honest, to be in that city, because the city is basically being destroyed. And yet, in the middle of Baghdad, there is a little house called Dar al Mahabba, the house of love. It is run by the Sisters of Charity, the Mother Teresa sisters, and they have picked up, literally picked up children from the streets who have been abandoned because of the terrible deformities that they have been born with, uh, partly as a result of Saddam Hussein's attacks on his own people. Of limbs, terrible uh, deformities, but all with uh, lively minds and, uh, and uh, spirits that uh, are so uh, full of joy and hope. And they're bringing them up as Christians. I said to the sisters, uh, don't people object because presumably most of these uh, children come from Muslim families and they said, well, nobody wants them. Who's going to object? God wants them, you see. Um, God's love is... Uh, we can say not only for those children, but especially for those children. In England in the 18th century, one of its commitments, as you know, of its leaders, people like Wilberforce, was the abolition of the iniquitous slave trade carried out between this continent, Europe, and America. The king was a friend and a brother, as they put it. They could not preach the gospel of freedom to people and enslave them at the same time. That is why they were committed to the abolition first of the slave trade and then of slavery itself. CMS uh, resisted uh, British imperial policies in many places. But off the coast of Africa, it cooperated with the Royal Navy to prevent the slave trade and its ships. Uh, from carrying out their wicked work. But these evangelicals were not just interested in slavery and in the slave trade so far away from them. They were also interested in the virtual slavery of working men and women in Britain itself, in the factories and in the mines. Children who never saw daylight, they were small enough to work in the mines, but they would never come out for the whole of their childhood. Women who had to work through pregnancy after pregnancy after pregnancy. There was no industrial legislation to prevent them. They started schools for the poor. You know, universal education is not an idea of the state. The level of nursing as a profession happened because of the evangelical revival. So many things that you can say have to do with the practice of the Christian life, practicing being a Christian. Also noted the dangers of capitulation uh, and of compromise. We have seen how a prophetic voice is necessary as a part of Christian mission. We have seen how it is important to be practical as churches and as Christians in our work today. This is why it's so wonderful that you are being prepared in uh, the caring professions, so many professions that will make a difference to people in this country and beyond this country. But,
That is not all mission is. It is also about proclamation. It is about bringing people to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, and you may say, well, if you've got all these other ways of doing mission, why proclamation? What's the need for it? Well, I'll give you just a few and then I won't need to stop. I have to stop, I think. Um, the first is that when we share the gospel with people, whether it is in a large rally or personally with a friend or a neighbor, it shows people something about who they are called to be. That they have been made in God's image. That God loves them. Uh, that God is calling them to restore that image in which they have been made and which has been spoiled by human sin. You know, the gospel is remembrance. Remembrance is a very important word in the Bible. It is reminding people of who they are. You remember the prodigal when he was with the pigs? What happened to him? It says, eventually, he came to himself. He realized that he was not, in the end, a swineherd. He was, in the end, the son of his father. And that is what caused him to walk back to his father. Of course, the business of coming to himself, of repentance, was not complete until he was overwhelmed by his father's love. But that's where it started. It is remembrance of who we are and also of what we have become. The gospel is also about the fulfillment. When we share the good news, with someone, it brings to a fulfillment all the genuine aspirations and hopes that they have. You know, I have met many people who have come to faith in Jesus Christ from another religious tradition, Islam or Hinduism or whatever it may be, even Judaism. God was preparing them for the good news of Jesus Christ. In strange ways sometimes, to us maybe, that God had been preparing them for the coming of the gospel. So the gospel is a fulfillment, as it says in Ephesians 1.10, of all those genuine aspirations and hopes that people have. Thirdly, and this is very important, uh, when we share the gospel with someone, it is also about assurance. You see, uh, I had an uncle who had been a very distinguished civil servant and as so many people do, uh, after he retired, he became a very pious Muslim. Uh, not so much before he retired, but after he retired. And he began to say his prayers five times a day and all of those things. And I said to him on one occasion, I said, is this getting you to heaven? And he said, I don't know. Honestly, he said, I don't know, I'm doing my best. What more can I do? But I don't know. But you see, accepting all that God has done for us in Jesus Christ, as Dr. Signoni was saying last night, this is assurance, first of all, about the reliability of the Word of God. You know, assurance is not primarily about how we feel, but what God's Word says. It's also about what God in Christ has done for us. So in the New Testament, salvation is spoken of as a past event. By grace, St. Paul says in Ephesians, you have been saved. By grace, you have been saved. It is a reality that you can know as having been done for you by all that Jesus Christ has done on the cross. Of course, it also says, you have to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. No letting off the hook here. And then, it says, those who confess with their mouths and believe in their hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead will be saved. So there is the fulfillment. But we have an assurance about this, not because of ourselves, but because of what Jesus Christ has done. Proclamation, the sharing, intentional sharing of the good news 
uh, is so important as part of that Christian mission of embassy and hospitality. And then finally, finally, uh, you know, preachers are allowed more than one finally, aren't they? Uh, that is to say, God's power should be released by the preaching and the sharing of the gospel. Um, minds are renewed. Families are remade. Uh, people are able to earn an honest living. Hearts and minds are healed. Friendships are restored. You see, if these things are not happening in a community, you have to ask whether the gospel has actually come. You know, the authenticity is shown by these words and works of power. So sisters and brothers, uh, thank you for giving me a hearing. I look forward to being with you for the rest of this week, uh, of course, to see how we may uh, feed on Christ uh, and how Christ uh, in fact feeds us and gives us uh, his water to drink so that we may never thirst again. I pray that your mission in this world will be not only in words, but also in power. Lord has spoken to us, we've been challenged. We've been reminded that a, a Christian presence makes a difference. And we know that God has saved us. And since God has saved us, we can use the salvation given to us freely as a gift from our Lord Jesus Christ and through his death on the cross. And that gives us power to transform and change lives. This is a challenge for us that as we go out, may God give us the grace to know that if I'm a believer, my presence should be able to effect a change and transformation wherever I am. This is what is it that our Christian presence is causing to change to our people. Father, in the blessed name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we do want to thank you so much for this afternoon and for the way that you have spoken to us. God, we just want to surrender our lives to you. As we said in the beginning, that our hearts are open before you. Father, you have challenged us with your word. You've challenged us, O oh Lord, that you call us, you send us, but also you come into our lives. Father, we pray that you'll be open, that you'll be able to come into our lives. And that as you change us, O oh God, you cause us to change the world around us. Lord, we've been reminded of many places where the gospel has transformed lives. The gospel has power to transform families. The gospel has power to transform every area of our lives. God, we pray that we go out as ambassadors entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation. And for bringing him to us, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will sustain him as he speaks to us through this week, that you will indeed give him good health, and that you will fill him every other moment, that whenever he speaks to us, your Holy Spirit will directly change us and transform us. We bless your name, we thank you. As we go out, we you send us out to be ambassadors of the message of reconciliation. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with each one of us as we go out to continue the mission work, as we go out to serve the Lord, as we go out to challenge others to come to Christ. Thank you so much for coming. We want to remind you to come once again at 5.15. Uncle Benny will be speaking to us. Let's give a big hand clap to the Bishop for sharing this.
living God. Do you know what angels are doing in heaven? In heaven, they are, they are celebrating and praising God day and night. And as we come together, let's lift our voices, knowing that this life is a gift from God.
thank you for the gift of life and thank you that you are our God and we are your people. We just want to join in with the angels and just declare that you are worthy. There is no one else like you, Jesus. God, we
because you've heard us and you're going to speak to us. So come and speak through your mighty name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you like to sit? Sit. Come. This evening we want you to remain expectant because the Lord is here and the Lord is going to speak to us. The Lord is here. Can we just thank God that He's here and just trust that He is here? And we want to thank Him because truly He's here. Scripture says that where two or three are gathered in their name and worshiping Him, His presence is there. And let's thank our choir for uplifting our hearts to come back again to continue to open our hearts and lift up the throne of grace to us. I want to make this remark. It is special. Every time I read scripture, I find that, especially in the New Testament, in the evenings, Jesus Christ performed many miracles. Jesus healed people in the evening. Jesus spoke powerfully in the evening. And because Jesus is here, he's going to perform this evening. He's going to speak to your heart and my heart. And we are going to come And so we want, in a very special way, on behalf of the university, especially the chaplaincy, to welcome and meet us the servant of God, Uncle Ben, and his dear wife. Welcome to the Uncle Ben in the chapel. And uh, as an Australian, when you like someone, you say hard things about them. And that's not very common in Uganda. But this evening, I cannot say anything harder than one about Uncle Ben. And take that, as I say it, I love him, he loves him like he loves us. He said to me in the chapel, Uncle Ben, let me say it. 